For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Good evening. Welcome to the Gist on Strategies Global. Good evening, and today I have with me Chetan Yagiri, who is the editor of Interstellar. Now, this I'd like to point out to you is the latest addition to the Strategies Global family. Interstellar is basically focusing on space. Um, India's obviously India's efforts in space, the local space industry, and it also give you an overview of what's happening worldwide in the space arena. So Jaitanya is the man who's going to be driving that website, and we're going to talk to him about uh, what Interstellar is all about. So I get a brief preview, uh, Jaitanya. Tell us a little more. Thank you. Thank you, Surya. Uh, I'm happy to be part of the SNG Bharat Shakti family with this new platform, Interstellar. Uh, so, our audiences, they might be interested. How did it all began? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I did not go 4.5 million years ago when the Earth began, but it began last year with some conversation. 2020 was a watershed year for the Indian space program. The Indian government initiated a long-awaited space reforms and by initiating those reforms uh, our government wanted the private sector to take charge of a lot of space activities in a big way uh, they've placed an equal pedestal for the indian uh, commercial space sector to take a coveted position sitting just next to isro uh, and contributing to the national space program prior to that the space program or the national space program was uh, synonymous with what isro isro yeah uh, but with the space reforms, the government uh, initiated two new agencies. One was the commercial arm, or one is the commercial arm, which is called New Space India Limited, NSIL. Then there is the Indian National Space Promotion and Authorization Center in space, which is based out of uh, Ahmedabad. And uh, both these entities are now in charge of assisting the private sector. So where NSIL sort of uh, purchases a lot of capacities uh, from ISRO and commercializes it for a variety of purposes like the launch we saw yesterday. In space is a, a promoter. It is a it hold uh, it is meant to hold hands of uh, the MSNEs and the startups as well as slightly bigger players who would want to avail uh, services or infrastructure that are uh, quite Earlier, they were restrictively held with ISRO. Mm -hmm. So if you need an access to a lab or an ISRO test facility, you go to InSpace, you register yourself, and whenever there is an open slot for you to use it, InSpace is there to provide. So this is unprecedented for India. Uh, so nearly 30 years after the economic liberalization, we've carried out space sector liberalization. We've always considered it as a strategic uh, domain for the country. It still is, but uh, you can't expect all the capacities to be developed by ISRO. And so the capacities have to be spread far and wide. And uh, you need to tap into the talent that resides uh, in the industry, in the academia, and make the most out of it. And for this very reason, uh, I approached uh, Nitin Gokhiji and uh, I told him that, look, you already run two successful platforms in Bharat Shakti and uh, Strat News Global, then it needs to be an effort uh, concentrating entirely on the space industry because it is going to grow big. You know, it's a multi trillion dollar economy in the making. Yeah. Uh, there are estimates which say that uh, the space economy of the world would be around three trillion dollars by the year 2050. Well, so to have majority stakes in it, for India to have that, uh, it's very important for. Uh, an informed readership, a readership that views the space sector not from uh, foreign spectrum or foreign lenses or spectacles. We need to watch this entire domain from our own vantage point. So Indian community, be it from academia, from industry, from lawyers, those who are into humanities, 
Interstellar is a platform for all of them, not just scientists and technologists. So Interstellar is going to track this new phase in India's space program, right? And the industry is going to be a crucial component of this program, an indigenous local industry. So give us a sense of where this industry is right now. What does it do? Does it have technical capacities? Does it have expertise, skills? Yes. So whenever we hear this uh, phrase that so-and-so technology is indigenous, that indigenization comes not only from ISRO laboratories, but also the, the making, the building of it, which happens through a wide variety of uh, industrial vendors, which form the part of ISRO's supply chain. So, for instance, if a rocket is built by ISRO, it is not exactly built by ISRO, but ISRO is at the center of it, and around it, just like planets, uh, you have the bunch of, vendors. Bunch, of, bunch of vendors. It could be MSMEs, large corporations, uh, entities which are only when good at developing a certain kind of product. Mm -hmm. And that's the only product that they build. So there are entities like these. Uh, so excuse me here. But isn't this where the world space industry also is? Small guys with a lot of niche uh, expertise and technologies. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a common place everywhere. But the main difference between, uh, let's say, the West, especially Western Europe or United States and India has been that these smaller guys had the leeway to innovate, mm -hmm. to come up with some innovative products uh, whose IP resides with them. In the case of Indian ecosystem, the vendors were building uh, components or systems or subsystems based on the designs that were provided by ISRO. Okay. So the IP wasn't residing with these companies. The reforms, what they've done is, they have sort of encouraged these private sector players to come up with their own IP and compete, not only in the Indian market, but in the global market. And these are exciting phases. So you have to keep a tab on such developments. You have to keep a tab on the market dynamics. And space is no more science and exploration only. Space is... Uh, there is a military angle to it, yeah, yeah. there is a commotion angle, there is a civilian angle to it, mm -hmm. there is a not-for-profit angle to it, there is a for-profit angle to it. There's so much happening around. And this all needs to be put in perspective. And that's why I interested in So when you talk of IPRs, you say ISRO had the IPR. Uh, can you think of any IPRs that are now held by a local industry or is it too early for that? It is too early for that, but I am expecting uh, some of the startups because they are developing some really new products. Uh, they will be having uh, their own IPs. So startups that are building satellites, startups that, that are building you know, downstream uh, services, especially the programs and softwares that go into it. Mm -hmm. This will be entirely niche, unique to them, and they will, I'm sure, they'll capitalize on it, mm -hmm. on the uniqueness, on their IP. And that capitalization would not only happen in the Indian or the subcontinental context, but also globally. So there's a the question of money. Where is the money for these startups coming from? Who's providing the funding? So for now, you would see uh, most of the venture cap firms are uh, sourcing their monies from uh, large financial sources. Every, uh, or, it, every, everywhere, everywhere. And if you trace it down to the government, it will be mostly uh, the defense sector. Okay. So, for instance, if you look at the American space program, it has its antecedents in Pentagon. Yeah, yeah. And Pentagon has been supporting the space program forever. NASA has been there around, but, you know, uh, relatively, it is more so the commercial contracts that have come from Pentagon and various agencies and entities within the Pentagon. So, from NRO... To, uh, to the U.S. Navy, to the U.S. Armed for Army, to U.S. Air Force. They will all be supportive of uh, all of these startups in their, in their case. In the Indian context, it has been public sector money. It has been the budgetary allocations. Uh, same as the case with China, it has, it has been more so the allocations made by the party uh, and its aspiration. And the driving force behind it always has been either socioeconomic progress of the country, in case of democratic countries, and uh, partly there's military angle, security angle to it. But uh, when it comes to not so democratic countries, uh, it is hegemony that trials here, the supply of funds. 
so these are the various factors that uh, you may come across around the world. You mentioned the military angle and space has always been seen as a strategic asset for India. Um, where is the military angle, where is the military aspect of uh, space? Where is it developing? I mean, is it um, under some one single authority? How does it work? So in the Indian context, you always had uh, uh, the Ministry of Defense interacting with ISRO through a specialized cell yeah. that was dedicated for um, uh, military liaison. And uh, ISRO used to provide technologies based on the requirements that are uh, solicited by the Indian Armed Forces. Uh, eventually, in 2019, just before the pandemic began, India established uh, something known as the Defence Space Agency. Mm -hmm. So, Defence Space Agency, Defence Cyber Agency and Armed Forces Special Ops Division. These were three new entities created under the CDSS office, the Chief of Defence Staff's office. And it is the Defence Space Agency which will be taking care of not only the R&D requirements of the military because the uh, the realms of warfare are changing quite yeah. dramatically. Yeah. And for that, an agency was initiated first. Eventually, we may see a sort of change in taxonomy mm -hmm. uh, in the Indian Armed Forces. Perhaps you may see that the Indian Air Force is renamed as mm -hmm. Aerospace Force or Space Forces. You never know that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there might be a separate command structure created for space uh, application entirely for the military purposes. Uh, we are entering into an era of uh, more than 4.5 generation warfare. Yeah. And uh, over here, uh, space-based assets will play a major role, uh, if not an offense, because uh, there are certain international legalities in place uh, which prevent putting up of weapons up there. But uh, definitely uh, command control, computers, uh, C4ISR, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, all these uh, aspects of any uh, conflict or during any conflict, be it a cold conflict or a hot conflict, uh, the, these are all dependent on space-based assets. So um, just like any other armed forces in the world, sophisticated ones, India is also marching in that direction. And uh, it's a fairly big a domain in itself and it might eventually also uh, supersede uh, the allocations that SO ever received for a uh, top talk. Yeah. Because defense remains a major concern for India because of the 2.5 front uh, yeah. war. Yeah. And uh, we have a blue water navy. Uh, for that blue water navy to penetrate into deeper oceans, for further oceans, you need consistent connectivity uh, with satellites. So, well, those are again uh, another areas uh, which are very important to us. So, I want to look at this geopolitical aspect of space, you know, that is now unfolding before us. Mm. Um, we are in competition with um, some immediate neighbors, I expect, yeah. and in cooperation with a lot of others. Although, that's a gray area, isn't it? Mm. Even cooperation is a gray area. Cooperation is a gray area because this is at the forefront of technology. Um, nobody would want to part away with technology that they cultivated and produced after immense efforts. So uh, there are countries who would want to engage. And that's the very reason why we've experienced in the past as Indians that technology did not come to us that easily. We've experienced it during the Kargil War. We've experienced that uh, slightly before, uh, during the phase that when we required the cryogenic engines. Uh, so it does not come by easily. But again, uh, it is a very good way for any country to initiate development of these kind of uh, stuff is because you then get to have a holistic understanding of where the world is moving. Unless you build it on your own. And uh, even, let's say if I give you a mundane example, even in schools, a teacher would tell a kid or a student that DIY, do it yourself. <laughs> So it is that. So unless you do it yourself, you wouldn't get a complete hang of what you are building and why you are building. Uh, today, or just yesterday when we launched the LVM3, uh, the biggest place of pride was the cryogenic engine. Yeah. Uh, so this has come to us uh, after a very long time. And uh, we would want to encash whatever high tech we develop. 
and we should be investing efforts in building such high tech even if it takes a long time even if it has a long gestation period we should still be investing in it and again interstellar uh, will definitely promote all these technologies that are built here in india so last question we also have some uh, small guys who are not known for any space expertise at all uae for instance which has got to do the space realm i mean they have a lot of money obviously mm. so do you see them as um, where do they stand in this entire uh, you know space uh, thing that is unfolding for us you know <clears throat> in my book which i had written 2 years ago india in the second space age of interplanetary connectivity quite a mouthful yeah. of a title but in that book i had mentioned about uh, three countries to look for one is australia which recently initiated its sp- space program and it is taking it up really well uh, kudos to them a uh, uae that you spoke about their space agency was established only in 2014 yeah. or 15 yeah uh, not very long ago not even a decade yeah. not even a decade and they are uh, flying to mars they've already flown to mars they are mm-hmm. now to uh, on to moon they are part of the new space station uh, activities they kind of outsourcing they are outsourcing it so the launch is being outsourced to japan a lot of technology is coming from the united states payloads are coming from the united states uae has had experience particularly with uh, satellites communication satellites you had some of the big uh, telecom players in the middle east uh, for example at isalad they have been uh, quite yeah, big yeah. Uh, with uh, promoting the use of satcom so uae has done that and these are the countries who will try to acquire a certain niche and uh, capitalize on that uh, likewise there you have luxembourg yeah. luxembourg yeah. is betting big on asteroid mining on extraterrestrial mining so they they are uh, accumulating startups uh, and by startups i mean ip mm-hmm. uh, which is extremely necessary for carrying out any mining activities let's say on an asteroid or on the moon so they'll have an important stake whenever those kind of activities you know would they take shape so uh, these are the countries who wouldn't develop full spectrum capabilities because their geography or their populations don't yeah. allow them to do that india is a vast country so there's no comparison uh, but they'll hold on to certain niches and they'll become integral part of the uh, the value chains that eventually emerge so they're looking far into the future they're punting big absolutely fascinating uh, chaitanya most strength to your arm thank congratulations and let's hope interstellar flies high i'm sure it will thank you but your support yes <laughs> absolutely <laughs> thank you thanks very much thank you thank you so there you have it interstellar going up and um, do track us uh, follow us all the time uh, as you follow uh, stride views global uh, thank you and good night